Ram, when we think of breakthroughs in biology, normally we think of the DNA revolution, these gigantic things. But what you've done with phantom limbs uh, has deep uh, implications for how the brain works. And it's just a, like a radical new way of seeing things. So what was the process? What, what's, what is the point? And, and, and how can we use phantom limbs to understand how the brain works? Well, basically, the phenomenon involves you know, my arm is amputated or lost in, in a car accident, and you continue to, continue to vividly feel the presence of the missing arm. We call that a phantom. Yeah. Often excruciatingly painful. Can you help the patient relieve the pain? Right. So, so the arm has been amputated either deliberately for disease or in, in injury, and I, and I, I feel it's there, but it, I have, it's painful. Uh, you have pain in the phantom very often, yeah. not always, but very often. Yeah. One of the first things we did was simply put a, take a Q-tip and did a routine neurology exam with a cotton bud, and he touched different parts of his body and face. And what do you feel? And remarkably, he said, well, I feel that touch in my phantom thumb. Oh. Even though thumb is here and face is here. Yeah, yeah. And it's missing. There's no arm there, and he feels it in, in, that, in that thumb. Right. And he touches his index finger, pinky, ball of the thumb. There's a map of the face on, 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 on the, of the hand oh. on the face. Oh. Now, how, why, why does this happen? It happens, I think, because the, in, the, in the map of the surface of the body and the surface of the brain, Complete surface of the body, every point is mapped onto a specific point in the brain. Yeah. There's what's, what we call a Penfield map right, of right. the body surface. The so-called homunculus. Homunculus, yeah. Now, in that body, it's map, the hand is right next to the face. Uh -huh. So when you amputate the hand, the hand area in the brain is hungry for new sensory input. So the sensory input from the face skin, which normally innervates the face area, yeah. adjacent face area, invades the vacated territory corresponding to the missing hand, uh -huh. fooling the brain into thinking that the sensations are coming from the missing hand. Wow. Then we did brain imaging to prove that this is going on. This is relevant to phantom pain because if there's miswiring during the rewiring, you get, you get phantom pain, one, one of the outcomes of that. Yeah. So a, a natural result of the plasticity of the brain, which in some cases is very good. If you have a stroke, you can eventually recover through plasticity. Here, it's, it's gone wrong. Gone wrong, yeah. Except we landed on the trick of, of using a mirror, which is widely known, but I'll mention it briefly. Yeah. The patient often would say, the phantom is awkward, it is clenching, my, my, my fingers are clenching into the palm, producing excruciating, excruciating pain. I cannot open my fist, it, it, it just locked that and it's very painful. Then you put your hand in, in, in front of this mirror, the mirror box, so you put this phantom on the left side of the mirror. The shiny side of the mirror is facing me, the physician, uh, and, the, and the patient looks at the, 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 the reflection of his normal hand in the, in the mirror, resurrecting optically his phantom hand. Uh -huh. Then you say, can you move your fingers with the normal hand, right hand, synchronously with the phantom, and, and clap or, or, yeah. or wave or something, but symmetrically. And it's really just the one hand being a mirror, and he's seeing both. That's, he sees both, right? Yeah. And he can't really move his phantom. He's already said that. Right. But he says, oh my God, it's un unbelievable. My movements have come back after 10 years. My phantom is moving again. Yeah. And the pain has gone away. The pain has been haunting me for months and months and years. It's gone away. Then you close your eyes, and he does it, and the pain comes back. So I said, I'm not going to get a prize for getting somebody to move a phantom limb. <laughs> but if he practices for, for a few weeks, then the pain does go away in about one third to have the patient's substantial reduction in pain using a mirror and, and nothing else. Now, that's surprising in, in itself. But what's even more surprising is pa patients with phantom limb. Listen to this, right? You have a patient with a phantom limb. And uh, I, I came across a paper by Giacomo Rigelati on mirror neurons and, and his colleagues. And one of the things that's been discovered is if you touch somebody on the skin, the sensory area in my cortex fires. The neuron in my sensory map fires. Elbow, another neuron fires. Chisho, another neuron fires. So, okay, that's fine. Well-known well known physiology. Now, if I watch you being touched, yeah. different parts of your body, that same neuron fires. 10% yeah. of the neurons will fire if I'm watching another human being being touched. This sounds like ESP. Of course, it's not. <laughs> it's, my brain is creating a virtual reality simulation of, the, of what's going on in your, in, your, in your body, so to speak, and, saying, and, and, and empathizing, saying, this guy is being... Something's going to hit his, face, hit his body, and he's going to experience the same thing I would experience if I were with my body or his head. So you do a mind reading, so to speak, a sort of virtual reality simulation of his, his sensations, and allows you to empathize with that person. Right. Okay, so this is surprising in itself, but the neurons should fire if you touch yeah. somebody else, right? Yeah. The same, the same area that if, I, if I'm doing it myself or I see you doing it. Correct. Yeah. Same area. Yeah. But only 10% of the cells. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Other, other cells are normal, regular cells. Right. Now, the interesting thing is, if I then say, um, why, why, why is it then I don't feel the sensation? If I, if I watch yeah. it being touched, yeah. same neuron is firing. If I poke you with a needle, I don't say, ouch, put it on yeah. my hand. Yeah. If I'm feeling everything that you're feeling, the neurons are firing in the amygdala and anterior cingulate for, right. for pain, right. pain sensation. Why don't I feel the pain you feel, not merely empathize with it? Mm -hmm. The answer is the skin around, in your skin, in your, in your, in your hand, does not have pain signals. 
not, he's sending a veto signal upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up, you're not in pain. Nobody's poking you. <laughs> Empathize, he's in pain. This computation occurs very rapidly, so I empathize, I empathize with you and I don't feel the pain. Now, what is the prediction from that? Yeah. Prediction from that is if you amputate my hand, I have a phantom, then I watch you being poked in your hand, then I should feel the pain in my phantom, because uh -huh. there's no veto signal. Uh -huh. Very simple hypothesis, right? Yeah. 100 years, 200 years of study in phantom, nobody had done that. We had three patients sit down and we just took as and opened their eyes and say, I'm going to poke my hand and see what happens in your phantom. The sure. Is it, oh my God, I, I, it's very strange, doctor. I, I experienced that pain in my, my wrist. That's very odd. Yeah. And then I said, how about this? Oh, that, I, that's in my elbow. I feel that pain. Oh, so that, there's a, that was a, a, a prick to, to yourself. Yes. <laughs> and and I'm my, feeling it in my phantom. You're feeling it in, in your phantom. Yeah. And this is extraordinary because it's dissolving the barrier between you and me. Yeah. The notion of self and, and others. <laughs> yeah. This tenuous barrier of skin and bone is, is dissolved <laughs> by removing the arm, and I start experiencing your sensations. Yeah. Now, third question, how do you help this patient? I said, go home, and then whenever you feel the pain in your phantom, you can't massage it because it's a phantom, <laughs> ask your wife to massage her, her hand, watch it. You get a phantom massage, does it relieve the pain? Uh -huh. And guess what, it does. But we haven't done controlled trials yet, so we don't know how prevalent it is. Mm. Tony Yang and, and Walter Reed is doing some work on this. Mm. But we hope it is, but it's even, even simpler than the mirror. Mm. All you need is another person. <laughs> Massaging yeah. himself. And, and this gives deep insight into the empathy, and it's, it's much broader than just the pure physiology of, of the phantom exactly, limbs. Exactly. So it's not merely telling you about phantom limbs and phantom pain, but the whole concept of empathy, including emotional empathy. In fact, we've seen patients, there's another group of patients, not patients, normal people, who have what's called congenital intersensory sensa referral sensations. Uh -huh. we, we call it congenital inter intersensory sensations. It's also discovered by uh, Jamie Ward in England and Sarah Blakemore. What you see is otherwise completely normal person, no, no phantom, nothing. Yeah, yeah. Normal person experiences your sensation. Just, just don't come out and tell people about it. Uh -huh. But she or he has had the entire, entire life. We call it interpersonal referral, okay? Uh -huh. The exciting thing is if you tickle yourself, yeah. she starts giggling, <laughs> un uncontrollable giggling. <laughs> and Claudia Sellers in our, in our department has worked on this. Uncontrollable giggling she experiences, and the patient experiences, and she can't stop. Yeah. Oddly enough, she can tickle herself. You and I can't tickle ourselves. Yeah. She can tickle herself because it's altered circuitry. Uh. And she'll also say, here's a very important point I want to make, right? If I may, when testing patients. People think you have to use sophisticated equipment, months of research, thousands of dollars. Yeah. You don't have to. Sometimes you do, but you don't have to. Here's a young lady telling me, she feels, if I do this, she feels in her, in her, in her leg. If I do this, she feels in her. How do I know she's not making it up to draw attention? So I said, okay. We have these two students sitting next to me. She's telling me that any, any time I touch, the student, she feels it. Mm. Or touch myself, she feels it, right? Mm. Did this. I did this to a student, so hitting her face. Yeah, yeah. The student flinched, withdrew, and she did the same thing. <laughs> no no normal never, person. And she didn't know you were going to do that. She didn't know I was going to do that. Yeah. No normal person flinches and draws back. Blink reflect does not occur. Right. They get a startled reflect to do that. Yeah. They don't do this. <laughs> Telling me immediately, you're dealing with a real phenomenon. Yeah. Secondly, I said, what if you. It's a lot put, cheaper than an uh, uh, FMOR. Absolutely. <laughs> But secondly, we do the simple thing. You say, what if you put your hand in hot water, boiling water? I put my hand in boiling water. Does she feel the heat? Yeah. Right? So I said, I'm going to do this. He said, no, no, don't do that. I said, no, don't worry. I'm going to put it, withdraw it quickly. And I had a bucket of uh, probably dry ice or something to, to make it look like it was boiling. Yeah. And I said, I did that. And she said, I felt the wetness in the, in the hand, but no heat. Oh. That's very strange, you know. And then I said, maybe the maps in the brain, sensory maps, the mirror neurons don't occur for for heat and warmth and yeah. cold, they only occur for touch uh, and pain, right? Yeah. We don't know why, but it has to do with the way the brain is wired. Right. Then I started talking to her, and I noticed she was doing something here, behind, my, behind her back. She was doing this, you see. Now, why is she doing that? Because earlier I dipped my hand in, in oh, the water. Yeah. It's still wet. She, she's still wet, so she's doing that, <laughs> and then she's just wiping her hand, you see. Now, that tells me that, that you could be dealing with a real problem. It's like the, the dog that did not bark on the night of the murder yeah. in Sherlock Holmes stories. That tells me more than six months of brain imaging. They've clinched the deal that it's really a real phenomenon. Now we can study it and she's very empathetic, hyper empathetic, as, as you just pointed out. Mm. So mm. very interesting syndrome that we, we stumbled on. Are you a Closer to Truth member? Register for free to get early access to full broadcast episodes. Join live interviews with the world's top thinkers and create custom video playlists. Visit closertotruth.com and click the register button 
I hope you'll join our Closer to Truth community.